Welcome to Curiosity Cake, the podcast for curious minds and big appetites. I'm Lee Delaney, your host and curator of ideas. I've got a really great episode for you this week. I'm talking all things ants with real life ant man, Balint Cacho. Balint is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Pennsylvania. This was a really fun episode with so many wow moments. Check out the show notes on the website for images of all the ants we talk about and more about Balint's work www.curiositycake.co.uk Don't forget to subscribe, rate and review the show which helps get us noticed amongst the mass of true crime and paranormal podcasts out there. And just to give you a heads up on an upcoming episode I'll be talking with Marianne Cantwell entrepreneur, coach and author of the best-selling book Free Range Humans which was one of the inspirations for me to create the podcast. So look out for that in the coming weeks. But for now, get yourself a cup of tea Grab a fork and dig into a slice of curiosity cake. Curiosity cake. Balint, welcome to Curiosity Cake. Thank you, Lee, for having me on today. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Thanks very much for your time. Um, I think this is a really exciting subject. So can you start off by giving us a bit of your background and how you got into studying ants? Yeah, so I've been interested in the science track most of my life, whether that be uh, studying in a research lab or even medicine. My parents are immigrants from Hungary and both of them went through medical school. But my mom is a pediatrician and my dad is a researcher. So I was always kind of exposed to like the primary research fields. And in college, I joined the research lab where we studied parasitic wasps and their hosts, Drosophila. And I just kind of caught the science bug and I really enjoyed the puzzle of life, essentially. So there I studied cellular immunity and started looking at behavioral immunity. So behavioral response of an adult fruit fly to fight off infection. And then I went to graduate school at... uh, Dartmouth College up in New Hampshire, where I was studied learning and memory and social behavior in the fruit fly, also in response to parasitic wasps. So it turns out fruit flies can communicate the threat of a parasitic wasp to naive flies that have never before seen the wasp, and they'll change their behavior and physiology to accommodate this potential threat of parasitism. And so I really thought this study of genetics and neurobiology in a social context was a really, really cool system. And then it was just left to the question of, well, for my postdoc, what kind of organism best fits that question? And actually the ant, which is highly social and has a really complex series of neuronal circuits and complex genetics, it's probably the best fit to study questions of, highly, of the highly social nature. So that's kind of what brought me to ants. I really love the fact you use the phrase science bug there. <laughs> yeah, so it's an unintentional pun. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a brilliant pun. I think that's the best pun on Curiosity Kick so far. So you're, you're really talking about that you have these kind of bigger subject areas like genetics and neurobiology that you're mentioning there. That's your main interest of study and the ants and the other insects you're looking at are your vehicle for studying that. Exactly. So my my dream is to one day be a professor and head my own lab. And there, I want to have multiple organisms. Later, I think we'll talk about the different kinds of ants that I study, but I'd like to have all these ants in my lab. And depending on the student who I have their question, they can pick the correct ant to ask that kind of question. And so there are the natural life history of these ants is, are very different but some provide the ideal vehicle to ask your particular question of interest. And what makes ants so good for that? So it's this old term that they're eusocial insects. So essentially they live, they have this colony lifestyle where it's almost altruistic. So the individuals don't much act like individuals, but rather they act as a collective working for the good of the colony. So you have a bunch of these social interactions constantly being exchanged because they're working together for a common goal. Now, the fruit fly system I studied, they had social interactions, but there was not a a collective theme kind of tying them together. So in nature, a fruit fly will land on a piece of rotting fruit 
and may communicate a threat, a predatory threat to an IE fly, but then they'll fly off and go their separate ways. Versus in an ant colony, you'll have an extended period of communication and cooperation as they work for the good of the queen. And so you could probe longer lasting questions of the the social context. And also what's really insane to me about ants is that in a colony, every single individual is almost genetically identical because they all come from the same queen. So you, they're almost clonal or like uh, twins. So in, in human twin studies, for example, you know, you could study uh, two twin, like identical twins born and yet they'll undergo very different lives. So like one will be become a movie star and the other become my assi- maybe a scientist and they might die of different things, but they're genetically identical. So that means that they're not having like, DNA mutations that cause differences in their disease susceptibility or their behavior or their personality, but rather it's modification of the DNA. So epigenetic, so turning on and off certain genes in particular ways due to environmental factors that cause these differences. So it's almost like while the colony is working together, you can have individual personalities that happen within the colony through these social interactions. And it's not like raw genetically based. It's not the DNA sequence. It's modification of the DNA. And you just don't get that in other systems. So you're talking about a few quite technical things there. So fruit flies, um, you started off with, but drosophilia yeah, That's so the wider term that fruit flies fall into, is that right? Yep. So there's under the genus Drosophila, you have hundreds of species. So the most common one is Drosophila melanogaster. That's the one used in most research studies. And then there's a, a ton, a ton of other species and different neat, uh, environmental conditions. So some prefer cold, some prefer warm, some are endemic only to certain islands, and some are worldwide. Um, so most, uh, Drosophila researchers use melanogaster and they generate mutations and various perturbations to the genome that people around the world use to study them. And it's actually, it's a funny story. Drosophila melanogaster turns out are very unique in the genus in that they don't represent the ancestral state as well as you might think. They're actually pretty newly evolved and have behavioral and genetic quirks that are particular to them rather than the ancient state as in most other fruit flies have. To some extent, you've graduated from studying mostly around fruit flies to ants? Yeah, in a way. I think I wanted to be able to have this more advanced social system to study. So while flies are a wonderful system to study fundamental questions of biology, And even more so because the genes that you can study in a fly or an ant are conserved in humans. So, for example, in humans, uh, mutation in the gene in FMR1 causes fragile X syndrome that manifests uh, with cognitive defects. And you can actually model this in a fruit fly. So you can remove that same gene and they'll also have cognitive defects. The same, and even in the ants, you can remove this gene and it'll have cognitive defects. And you can do drug studies where you can give them a drug and see, okay, does this help the cognition defect that you observe or does it make it worse? Um, But, you know, there are some of these mutations that affect social interactions, like autism spectrum disorder. You can model in a fruit fly by making a mutation, but because they're not very social animals, you know, I, like humans, for example, you might only be asset or studying one dimension of the characteristics. But in an ant that's highly social and communicates with individuals constantly, if you make it the ant essentially autistic by removing some genes, you could see a much more of a variety of behavioral traits that could be more representative of what happens in humans. But I, I really like that complexity. Yeah, and that that variety then, as you're talking about that, I'm really wondering, how do you go about measuring cognitive defects in insects or or any kind of cognitive element? It's a very good point. So we have in fruit flies, um, I studied memory and learning behavior. So there's a couple of different experiments that you can use to measure 
how well an insect learns. So there's some associative memory paradigms, and this works in mice as well, so it's not limited to insects, where you give them an odor, let's say, and you pair it with an electric shock. And the flies will eventually learn and that the odor is associated with electric shock, and they'll have freezing behavior. So essentially, they'll try to, they get scared. And when you were, eventually, when you train them, you can give them the odorant only without the electric shock, and they'll show that same freezing behavior. So they're almost, re- they're remembering that, oh no, this odor means bad. Let me just stop, even though you didn't provide the shock. There's also positive association. So instead of having this negative electric shock, you can pair an odorant with a food reward. So something that the insect or uh, mouse as well really likes, you pair with an odorant, like a vanilla odor, and then you can measure activity. So the insect or mouse will get really active and really excited for this food reward. And eventually you can just give them the odor without the food, and they'll show that same response. So they remember that exposure. There's also non-associative memory, where you don't have that link to, let's say, an odorant. So the assay that I used was you expose fruit flies to the paras- a parasitic wasp that is a threat to their offspring, and, the fl- and then you remove the wasp after a training period. And the flies will have a maintained behavior for about five days after wasp removal that starts to decay with time. So they remember very well initially that there is a wasp here and they do have certain behavior, but then they start to forget because the wasp is now gone. And so a cognitive defect would be if you mutate or remove a gene that is involved in cognition and memory and you run this mutant fly or ant or mammal through a test, they don't remember compared to control animals. And that's how you know, okay, this gene is important in either the acquisition of the memory or the maintenance of the memory. So the reason I think insects are such a great system over mammals is that number one, mammals are very expensive to keep in a lab, not just a dogs, obviously, but even mice, like the mouse research cores run hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to maintain them to keep and obviously we need to keep them in a humane way they're feeding their maintenance but insects are very cheap to keep and there is not really ethical guidelines of you know how many fruit flies do you keep in a vial you know you can have hundreds in a vial or you can have tens in a vial it's important to account for these things because they can influence behavior but it's really like the flies themselves are not suffering if there's a lot of flies and there are a few flies and also their lifespan is shorter. So you could ask questions about learning and memory and their link to age in a span for a fruit fly of 40 days. But for a mouse, you're looking at two to three years. And so time and money are important. And so I think insects, you know, the genes are conserved between mouse and insect. So I think asking the question in insects first, and then if you want to pursue them in mammals makes you know, more economical and scientific sense. Is there a large amount of our genes then that are similar to ants, fireflies that makes this kind of research applicable? Surprisingly, yes. So it's always talk to people and they're like, no, a bug, I'm unique. I'm not like a bug. But 90% of your genes are conserved between human and insect. And not only like maybe the coding, the sequence themselves might be different, but the protein that's created from the translation of the RNA is the same. So this fMR1 gene we talked about earlier that causes fragile X, the protein structure is almost identical between human and a fruit fly. And then its function is almost identical as well. Now, of course, there are insect specific genes. For example, ecdysone uh, regulates how quickly an insect goes from a larval state to an adult. So of course we don't have that because <laughs> we don't develop in that way. But the I think the really interesting disease implicative genes you, you have in an insect. So one cool experiment I'm working on now is trying to give an ant colon cancer. And you might think, <laughs> oh, you know, oh, how do... Not so cool for the ant, is it? <laughs> no, 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 no. But, but what's... I find amazing is that you can do it because the genes in 
human colon cancer are known. And if you mutate the two genes that are mutated in most human colon cancers, if you mutate those two genes in an ant, you elicit a cancer in the gut, which is the equivalent of the colon in a human. And so you don't, you don't have to do anything fancy like insect specific XYZ. It's the exact same genes and you cause an overgrowth of cells. So it might, you know, it looks a little different, the insect gut compared to a human colon, but the fundamental biology is the same. And so you can ask really interesting questions of like, okay, this ant has cancer. How will it be affected if I give it this drug? Or how will it be affected if she's by herself? You know, does that exacerbate the condition? And all these variables you can now ask that you could never ask with obviously a human and it'd be very difficult to ask in a mouse. So somewhere there's a lab where there's possibly researchers who are trying to get ants to smoke to give them lung cancer? It wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> there are, you know, ants, the, the way insects breathe is also I found fascinating, right? They don't, they have a mouth, so you might naively think, well, they breathe through their mouth, right? No, they actually breathe through their skin. So if you were to blow smoke into an ant nest, it, that's it's going in through their exoskeleton that's where their breathing apparatuses are and so they're just like all over being coated throughout their system with the smoke so you could essentially be inducing lung cancer that way and maybe even other cancers as well because their lungs are essentially throughout their whole body oh sure yeah that would be a whole lot of different cancers all at once wouldn't it but that might be cool too you know it's it's your <laughs> really the limiting factor here, which is what I find to be really exciting about insect studies. There are going to be some vegetarians, vegans listening to this that aren't going to like that bit. <laughs> well, it's for their health benefit too, you know. I think that's a good place then to get into what makes an ant an ant. Yeah, so it's a very good question is, you know, what are ants and how did they get here? And so the study of ants in the classical term is called myrmecology. So a myrmecologist studies an ant, not necessarily in the context that we've been talking about, but rather what makes their colony, what are the workers, queen, males look like, and what are the features of a particular species of this insect. And they're studying the ants for the sake of studying the ants. Yeah. So like what are, how many antennal segments do they have? How many, what's the length of the leg, the length of the abdomen, and like these very important characterizations from a natural history perspective. So, and I think it's very important to do, to characterize these. So it's a very like a taxonomical approach. And in modern times, you can also do a genetic approach. So you can sequence the genome and kind of see, okay, I've found this what I suspect to be an ant. Let me compare it to other genomes that were sequenced that have been defined as an ant and see how closely related or not it is. And that's kind of how people discover new ants all the time. Now, feature-wise, what creates an ant? Um, in modern terms, there needs to be within the antenna, an, essentially an elbow, so that the antenna comes from the head. Essentially, then you have an elbow joint and then a second antennal segment that can then pivot and move around this joint. So the antennae are a very important feature. Its body plan is also conserved to be defined as an ant. So you have the head, you have an abdomen, you have the petiole, which connects the thorax. So the head connects to the thorax, the petiole connects the thorax to the abdomen. And so this body plan has to be in place to be defined as an ant. It also has to have six legs. Um, the reason I point this out is because there's actually spiders who mimic ants. You can Google it. Um, these spiders will tuck, you know, they have eight legs. They'll tuck two of their legs up and make them appear as antennae and actually trick ants into welcoming them into their nest and eat them, <laughs> which wow. is, you know, nature's amazing. That is amazing. And then you might think, well, colony, a colony should really be a function of an ant, right? Well, it turns out not so much. Um, there are ants defined as ants that have colonies upwards of 20,000 individuals. And then there could be colonies that have as many as 10. So the colony number 
And really the definition of how colonies happen is not a fixed definition in what an ant is. It's assumed that you'll probably have some flavor of colony structure, but it's not a ubiquitous term. And so ants have been around about 168 million years is the earliest sample found. And actually, this was a publication that came out a few weeks ago describing the hell ant. So it's a very unique looking ant that was preserved in a piece of amber and it's attacking a prey. And so they did a 3D reconstruction of this individual attacking a prey through CT scans of the piece of amber and they generated what ancient ants really look like. And it was very much a hunting behavior, active hunting of living in, uh, individuals. They have very big teeth and they have very big eyes for these visual hunting behaviors. That's kind of breaking news then. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a unique name because of its large jaws. They call it the hell ant. I should say at this point that we'll have some images and photos of all the ants that we talk about that people can have a look at uh, while they're listening along as well. So have an idea of what it is that we're actually talking about. Yeah, definitely take a look at the hell ant. It's, it's a thing of nightmares. So in terms of their evolution, one of the things that I read that I wanted to ask you about was a suggestion there was a period around 60 million years ago where ants might have been a dominant species on the planet. Yeah. Is that right? Or is that something that's just been made up? So I don't think it's been made up. I think one might even argue they're dominant species today, depending <laughs> on how you define dominant. So this is like the, the scientific catch-all term of what is dominant. And, and from a biologist's perspective, it's the ability to reproduce and disperse and colonize. And if you look at ants, they're everywhere in the world with the exception of Antarctica, for all we know. I mean, they're very well maybe ants on Antarctica. You know, expeditions aren't really sufficient yet. But it's that ability to have be ever-present in the world and have successful evolutionary niches that they can live in all these different settings. You know, like there's an ant species that lives in the desert. There's one that lives in the jungle. There's one that lives in even Siberia. And so that's what kind of defines their highly successful nature from a scientific standpoint. Now, humans are the same, right? We can colonize all over the world and we adapt to our system, but we adapt to the location by, you know, making clothes that keep us warm or inventing air conditioning so we can go really hot. But, you know, all these like really intense breakthroughs, but not by natural selection where we now look different and act different in different regions of the world. Um, we're all the same species, we're all the same, regardless of if we look a little different, while ants, their morphology is so unique to their particular region of it, like lit life region, and that's what how they function best. So that's why it's been suggested that they are so successful, because evolution has driven them to just take over wherever they've colonized, and they have the structural features to be the best at it. Wow, so we've really evolve to be able to cope with all these different kind of environments probably through using our intellect but for ants that's just part of their evolution and biology exactly so if you just google ant you'll know that they're so they look so different there's so many species and they some have giant teeth some have little teeth some have huge eyes some have barely any eyes and it's like what on earth is going on here and it's all because these these differences are all due to the local adaptations that make them the best possible ants to live where they live. And so when you study ants, you have to take into account, like, where did you get them from and what are they suited to do based, like, what's their life history like? And these traits kind of define what makes that ant so unique. And, you know, even nowadays, like, if you look at how much of the biomass in the world is made up by ants. Some studies have it between 15 and 25% of the total biomass on earth are ants. And that's just nuts to me, right? Like you think of all the thousands of animals you could think of, and you're like, oh my God, they barely make a dent compared to ants. And the biomass, is that just accounted for animals? Uh, animals, plants, fungi, fish, birds, you know, anything that's alive is characterized wow. in that. 
And, you know, there's roughly, um, I believe it's like 12,000 species of ants, but there's estimated to be almost double. Yeah. And it's only because of like the rate at which we find them yearly, brand new species just keep doubling and more and more. And just imagine like on charted parts of the world, there's even some ants that live near volcanic active volcanoes. You're like, well, how on earth could that happen? And it turns out they have within their, uh, hemolymph or blood, um, factors that allow them to survive in high temperatures. It's like, wow, how did that happen? And it's again, that's <laughs> specialization. It's that particular region in which they live in. So possibly ants are the future. If we end up destroying the planet, ants will be the things that survive. <laughs> you know, it may, they may very well be, yeah. <laughs> A little doom and gloom kind of look at it, but I mean, they're so dominant <laughs> and there's so many different adaptations that they have. You know, I, I don't know like if there are, if there's any that are really not susceptible to radioactivity, like the, the cockroach, but you know, chances are there probably are some out there. If there was a study a few months ago where they went to Chernobyl and they found a colony of ants living under the abandoned reactor. And actually the ants had built up like uh, an ant bridge and have escaped from their original nest site. So they didn't do any genetic characterization of it. It was more just taking pictures and be like, Oh look, this ant colony is living in a highly radioactive place. Um, But one might presume that maybe they are kind of resistant to radioactivity now. Uh, I, I'm going to have to try to stop myself saying wow every couple of minutes with this. I think there's there's too many really amazing things going on here. Well, that's, see, that's why I got sucked in yeah. <laughs> the ant system because it's almost like a kid coming up with what, well, does this happen too? Yeah, it does. Oh my God. Let's start. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I've I've not actually ended up sticking with a career in academia because of the the specialization that you need to really get into. I'm someone that likes variety and moving from one thing to another thing, following interest, hence the way this podcast works. Um, But maybe ants is the way to solve that as well (laughs) with so many different kinds. Yeah. I think I'm kind of similar in that regard. Like I can't study one protein for the next 30 years. I mean, there's labs that do that and it's very important work but i would just i just can't so i need to have big picture like the effect of a mutation on on the organism itself like the individual all the way down to the molecule and then back again rather than just looking at how one molecule interacts with another molecule for the next 20 years i'm like oh my god i can't do that (laughs) yeah i can i can totally relate to that when i was a kid in our primary school we used to have books about insects bees and and other things are the ones that kind of stick out that i remember and i would read these for fun and i remember other kids would come up look at what i was looking and be like oh that's disgusting what are you reading that for i'm just wondering i'm sure you get that regularly going to dinner parties talking to people about what you do yeah 100 percent. it's usually met with a face of disgust (laughs) <laughs> with fruit flies right it was like oh bug so one of the things i i really like outreach and teaching people about the value of these insects and what we can study from a scientific perspective so i've tried i've learning graphic design and i've made a, a cute ant cartoon that i named antonia like, there's another pun for us <laughs> <laughs> and it's just the attempt at showing kids and young audiences that first of all it's a cute ant so it kind of sucks them in and then you could tell them like oh what all the different things that we can use them for and i find that actually it's been a nice icebreaker so the lab that i work at the burger lab at penn we actually have middle and high school students who come to the lab and we teach them running basic experiments uh, using cell culture and bacterial systems but we also show them the ant room and there's always the kids who come into our ant room, which is essentially a giant incubator where we keep all of our ant species and different colonies. And they just are like, ew, it smells. (laughs) And then they, I open up a nest and they like back up very quickly. Like, Oh my God, it's going to bite me. Um, But I found if I first show them our cute little ant, Antonia, 
then they're like, oh, this is this is kind of okay. And then they're more likely to come and take a look. And then they start having the reaction that you and I are having right now, which is like, mm. wow, they're almost all these are female. You know, like people, kids watch A Bug's Life from the Disney Pixar movie mm-hmm. where you're the lead is Flick, a male ant. Turns out a male ant wouldn't actually do anything and they're dead in two weeks. They're only <laughs> uh, so like the soldier ant in the ant colony is not male. It's they're all female. And so you start, he- you start hearing these things and then you see their eyes light up. And so it, it's that initial icebreaker, like you said, of getting over that this is a gross bug. If you can get over that. Then you can also all of a sudden be like, wow, this is a really interesting system. And then I, my favorite is when kids start asking questions of like, well, well, how does this work? And I can tell them, you know, I really don't know, but maybe one day you'll study this. And then, the look in their eye like really i can study that it's just (laughs) it's awesome there's potentially a very different direction for disney movies to go there as well i think especially in today's world right like girl power is a big thing and i feel like you're sitting on a gold mine with ants because the the male like i said are essentially useless (laughs) Um, (laughs) it's all like, and when we talk later in the pod about the various ant social structures, like you'll hear, like, you really do nothing. It's the females who run the show here. Seeing as we were mentioning it then, can you tell us you know, what is the colony? Why is it important? Although you've hinted a bit that it's not necessarily, you know, 100% of ants kind of operating within colonies, I think. Yeah. So, like, uh, in the typical definition, a, a colony is where you have individuals and then there's a division of work and reproduction. So an ant colony will have a queen and an established colony, the ant's queen's sole job is to lay new individuals. That's it. She doesn't eat for herself. She's actually fed by workers. Um, so she doesn't have to collect the food. She just kind of sits there and wanders around the nest as she wants and just lays eggs. And then there's workers who are non-reproductively active. So in the classic definition, these individuals will not lay eggs. They cannot lay a new queen. For example, in honeybees, you can the workers can create new queens by feeding larvae royal jelly, which has particular epigenetic components. So turn this jelly turns on genes in the larva to make it a queen. You know, you don't have that in the ant system. Only a queen can lay a new queen. And so you have this division of labor. And there the definitions start to get more specific. So what are these workers? In very simple colonies, you could have one kind of worker that does everything. So a worker that hunts and a worker that takes care of the nest. And it's usually an effective age. So very young workers stay in the colony and take care of larvae or eggs or the pupil state, so that's the life cycle of the ant. And then older workers tend to leave the colony and forage for food and bring back food for not just the queen, but also the rest of the colony. And so that's the the more classic definition of what a colony is, and it's viewed as what's been called as a super organism. So it's individuals working for the collective, like we talked about earlier, but it almost acts like a a whole system. So like the reproductive unit of this colony or the body, this organism is the queen. And then you have, you know, the cells that take care of the bot, the queen, you know, could be like some of the, the young workers and the eating behaviors by the old workers. And if you were to remove any one of these components, the whole colony would fall apart. Is the colony then related to what you mentioned earlier? Is that all the ants in the colony are almost genetically identical. Exactly. So there are cues, and they vary, we'll talk about later, the different types of ancestral state colonies and more advanced colonies, but they have marks, um, whether that be olfactory, so that each colony smells unique. So you can actually measure what odorants are on the exterior of an ant by soaking them in pentane and this pentane solution you put into a machine called a mass spectrometer and you could figure out what molecules make up the cocktail of odorants on an ant 
and you look from one colony to another, you'll find that they're different, which is really, really cool in itself. But it turns out that's how ants tell each other apart from different colonies. And so they can tell, like, are you my sister because you smell like me? So it's almost like an immune recognition. Like they recognize self, so they don't attack self. But if you take an ant from one colony and you put it into another, the ants will attack her because she smells different. Which is a very, it's kind of like why colony wars happen is because an individual from one colony will wander over into the territory of another and she smells different. And so that's why they attack her. And what's cool is you can, you can mask um, the deodorant so you can paint on various kinds of odorants on the new ant that you're putting in so you can trick them into believing that she's from their colony if you provide the correct odorants. And actually a really, really fun experiment from the 1960s by E.O. Wilson, he discovered the death pheromone. So the way that they know an individual is dead is because it releases, a dead ant releases a smell called oleic acid. And if you paint oleic acid onto a living ant, the ants will pick her up and take her to their morgue or their trash pile, even though she's not dead. But she's giving off the cue of, I am dead. And then eventually the oleic acid wears off and she's allowed back into the colony because now she's recognized as living. Well, there's an interesting tangent there. And you're joking about it a bit, but an ant morgue, is it, do they have a set way that they deal with dead ants from the colony? Yeah, so they, they're to the level of complexity to this is mind blowing to me. So in the the nests that we have in the lab, they'll actually have a segment of the nest either inside of the nest itself or outside, where they take their trash. So food that has started to rot, they remove from the colony where the developing embryos are and place it outside of the nest. And the same with ants that have died. And the hypothesis is is that this is to prevent infection or fungal spores to take over the developing um, individuals within the colony. So there's not necessarily like a ritualistic behavior like elephants where they pass a dead elephant's tusks around, but rather it seems anticipatory and cleanly to take care of your, your trash and your dead by moving them outside the nest so that whatever caused their death doesn't spread to healthy individuals. Yeah, that sounds very sensible. Yeah, but, but how does that evolve in an ant? You know, like, <laughs> you'd say this is just a simple bug, but that's a very complicated behavior to recognize that this is important and then actually do it. It's just mind-boggling to me. So you're saying as well, there's there are different levels of complexity to colonies. So some will be very small, some will be very large um, in size, but also the levels of complexity can differ as well. Yes. So... I'm lucky to study essentially all three layers of this complexity in the lab that I'm in now. So I can briefly go over them. So we'll have images, I believe, for these as well. So if any of the listeners want to check out what these ants look like, what we think the most ancestral state is, is this ant species we study called Harbignathus saltator. And if you take a look at the pictures, you'll notice that they have really, really big eyes and long pincers. And so their life history is important here. And it turns out they're very, very visual hunters. So we actually feed them live crickets that they catch with their pincers. And then they actually sting with a venom that they have in their abdomen. And this venom is a paralytic. So they paralyze their prey. They feed this cricket to either themselves or their offspring. So the larvae will eat this cricket as well. And then once the animal dies, they no longer eat it. So they have a preference for living animals. If the animal has died, um, they never recover from the paralytic. I should say that as well. Once the animal dies, they put it into the trash pile, which so you have to constantly clean their nests. And if you look at the social structure of these ants, it's very basic. So by that, I mean the queen does not look any different than a worker. They all morphologically look alike. So how do we know who's the queen? So their behavior is different. So the queen right lays the eggs, but a queen in this system is very docile. So you can open up the nest and whichever ant doesn't run towards you 
to try to defend the colony is probably the queen. It's a very cool system. And then what's even more bizarre is that this is a plastic system. And by that, I mean any individual in the colony can actually become a queen after they've hatched as an adult, which is unheard of in other ant systems. And this is most likely to accommodate a queen loss. So if you remove the queen, the worker ants will actually start fighting with their antennae. And we call it an antennal duel. It doesn't hurt any individual ant, but rather they flick each other with their antennae constantly over the course of seven days. And each day, fewer and fewer ants are fighting until you have one ant that has won. I don't know what signal goes into this to determine who wins and who loses, but the winner actually has then activated ovaries. So she will start laying. And what's even more amazing is that her life's lifespan multiplies by six. Even so she's genetically identical to the worker, but for some reason her lifespan now multiplies by six. And we think that's due to epigenetic regulation. So there's some kind of, same DNA sequence in the worker and the queen, but whatever DNA sequence that's important for lifespan extension is now turned on in the but, ant. But that's getting turned on from her winning this mega fight? Exactly. How does that happen? I wish I could tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, you know, we believe that it's conserved through the gene. So we have some targets in mind, and the targets that we've identified are actually conserved in humans. So it'd be really cool that the sales pitch is always that we want to make grandma live longer, right? Everyone loves their grandma. It'd be great if she could live longer. So like if we could turn on this gene, like she could actually live longer. And it's not just that these ants live longer, but they're like more geriatric the longer they live. So a typical worker lives six to eight months and this ant, Yulia anointed ant queen will live four years. And it's not that she's like really, really geriatric by year two is that she actually shows signatures of youth so she's molecularly as young as a four-month-old ant worker but she's actually two years old and where it gets even crazier is if you take this newly anointed queen and you put her into a colony where there's already a queen and i should note that that odorant that we we talked about the yeah. identification of cat colony does not happen in this very ancient ant species because okay. they're so visual so they're much more visually mediated so the olfactory system is not as evolved if you put that new, new queen into an established nest that has a queen the workers will actually swarm her and hold on to her with their pincers until her ovaries shrink and she reverts back to a worker and what's nuts is if she has lived longer than what a normal worker is expected to live, she dies within a week. So whatever gene that was turned on to give her extended life is turned back off when she's reverted to a worker. That's incredible. Right? And yeah. so the, these colonies, you know, they have this insane plasticity where individuals can transition from queen to worker and worker to queen they're on the smaller side. They're very visual animals. They usually uh, hunt on the jungle floor and they will walk back to their nest, but vision is a big deal to them. So that's what, and this ability to transition makes them the more ancestral state. Moving on from that, you can have specialization. So in Harbognathus, you have one kind of worker. They all look the same. They do one, they do multiple jobs dependent on age, so taking care of brood, so offspring or hunting. But if you move up in the evolutionary chain, you get more specialized systems. So one of the ant species I study is Camponotus floridanus. So it's the carpenter ant, and we particularly study the strain from Florida, um, although very similar to other Camponotus around the world. There is a queen who's fixed. So she is the queen of that colony forever. She cannot be dethroned by a new queen. She lays all the eggs and these eggs will develop into workers that look very different. So in the images I sent, you can see that there is a small ant and that's called the minor and then a large, larger ant and that's called the major. The minor's job is to take care of the offspring and to get food. 
while the major's job is to be the soldier and to defend the colony. And actually, if you look at them, they, their eyes are quite smaller than Harbignathus. And if you look at their brain structure, the optic lobe, so the processing unit of visual information, is much smaller than a Harbignathus optic lobe. And so you get this layer of specialization. Um, to get a new queen here, you have to have what happens is that the uh, established queen seasonally will lay uh, unfertilized or unfertilized eggs called uh, gynes. So these will hatch. You'll have um, potentially new queens that come out that have wings. Um, they will fly away from the colony and try to find males. They'll mate. Upon mating, the, this newly mated queen lands, eats her wings. So she uses her wings as, metabol as a metabolic source and will start laying in ants to start taking over like being as part of her colony so they look to create new colonies exactly versus the harbignathus if you have very large colony or larger sized colonies they'll usually split off and establish a new one by having a worker become a new queen so it's a very different dispersal mechanism as well and then what i consider kind of the, the pinnacle of complexity is that there's ant species called um, Atta cephalodes. So these are the leaf cutter ants that have up to 10 casts. So they have queens and males, but then there's eight worker casts. So there's of different sizes too. So it's a, a spectrum of size. So it's extremely complex. They look different. They act different. Um, there's ants that go and find the leaves and cut them. There's ants that pick up these cut leaves and take them back. So a misnomer of leaf cutters is they don't actually eat leaves. They farm a fungus and they farm it by feeding the fungus leaves and then they eat the fungus that they are growing, which is, so they're only the only other animal on earth that farms beyond humans, <laughs> which is also like, what, what is that? That's about? Awesome. Um, so there's <laughs> the cast that takes back the leaf to the fungus there's a cast that rides on top of the leaf as it's being carried back to the fungus. And what it, that ant does is that it fights off parasitoids that might try to infect um, the leaf carrier because the leaf carrier is actually has her antennae down and she's smelling the scent path to get back to her nest. So she's distracted. So in order to prevent her from being infected by anything you have a, essentially a lookout on the leaf that fights off parasitoids when they come uh there is the super soldier so they we call her super soldier because she's just massive huge teeth um, these teeth are actually can cut through skin quite easily and in costa rica where these ants are endemic to um, they're used as staples um, if you're out on the mate on the trail like hiking and you've lacerated your side, what you can do is pick up a super soldier and put her close to your cut and she bites and then you rip the body off and the head essentially stays put and has stapled your skin together. So that's the bite. <laughs> <that they have. laughs> Crazy, right? But like they're so strong animals. You then have nurse ants that take care of the brood, um, similar to before. You have gardener ants that take care of the fungus garden. So they, they tend to the fungus and make sure that everything's okay. And you also have um, what I find very unique is the trash ants. So these are ants that we suspect are very old, the, whose job it is is to take out the trash from the nest. So actually, when you have a leaf cutter colony, you have to have a separate room for them where their trash is kept. And these ants take the, the trash to the trash room and are not allowed back to the fungus garden. Sounds like you maybe need to uh, put some of the odor on those guys and put them into your other colonies to clean up that rubbish for you. Yeah, if only it's a time lapse movie. There, what you can do is you can disturb their trash. So they they organize the trash in a very particular way. It's not just haphazard in a room. It's there's a clear structure to it, and you can mess up their trash pile, and in 20 minutes they'll re remake the trash pile into a nice tightly packed. <laughs> trash pile as it were and it's quite amazing i don't know what really drives that behavior but it is really freaking cool yeah you definitely need to send me that yeah absolutely and so they're not allowed back into the colony and we suspect this is the case because um 
if they touch the fungus with all of their like various um, microbes that they bring from the trash, it could kill the fungus. The final cast is called the chewer cast. So when the, the leaf is brought back to the fungus, this cast actually removes the cellulose extra outside layer of the leaf so the fungus can penetrate it and continue to grow. So it's highly specialized. Um, you know, these individuals look and act different. And one of my projects now is to figure out, like, what's the molecular mechanism that drives this behavior? Because, again, I just listed off 10 casts for you, but they're genetically almost identical. But they look very different and act very different. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, why? How on earth does this happen? So do we think that this division of labor, these 10 casts, if you're an individual ant, do you go into one of those casts based on your genes? Or the activation of them, yeah. So from a developmental standpoint, at least for the leaf cutter, you can see once they reach the pupil state, they actually don't grow in size. So after an adult hatches, they don't get bigger. And you could tell with the pupil state what probably what they're going to be. So the super soldier pupa is huge, and the nurse pupa is really small. So we think early in life there was a, some kind of cell fate decision to turn off the series of genes that make you a super soldier and turn on the genes that make you a nurse and what that deciding molecule is we don't know i mean right now we also don't know what genes are active in a super soldier like in the adult stage and how does that compare to the active state of a nurse actually that's an experiment i'm planning to run in a few weeks to sequence that and figure out okay well what are the genetic differences in the adults and then we will go back in time to the developmental stage and see how they correlate. So it sounds like over time they can change which cast they're in in certain colonies. Yeah, there seems to be an age effect where older workers tend to be, I believe, doing what we'd call the more dangerous behavior of leaving the colony and you know foraging for food because there's a higher likelihood that you're not going to come back from that or you might die versus if you're within the nest itself and it makes evolutionary sense to not have the young ants like switch it right like have the young ants leave and the old ants stay in and take care of the brood because you could have a huge disparity between the numbers of the two casts it just is a function of how often they can come back and so that's why we believe that there's that age disparity and what's as a tangent, what's really cool is you can induce behaviors of different casts um, in in the fixed cast. So, for example, in Camponotus, the miners um, forage and the majors never forage. It's a very easy system to look at. And we found that it's because there's expression of certain genes in the minor that are not expressed in the major. And it's because there and there's these epigenetic factors that repress genes in one cast, but not repress genes in the other cast. And so what you can do is actually inject this repressor into the head of a major. So essentially bathe its brain it with this repressor and then just see what a behavior it does. And so you could actually have a major start doing foraging behavior as if it were a minor, which I, you know, it's really, really cool. Can you do the reverse of that? You can, although injecting minors is much harder, as I'm currently finding out. Uh, they're much smaller. So their headspace is almost all brain versus the major's headspace. It actually has the same size brain, maybe a slightly bigger than the minor, but most of the major's head is full of muscle. And this is to control its bite force. But you can inject a miner with the opposite kind of so activator, and you can drive it to be more of a patroller, and it won't forage, which is, it shows there's a level of plasticity there that na nature is not taking advantage of, right? But it's probably suggesting that that's the more ancestral state, like in Harbignathus, where the colony can adapt to what it needs. And I suppose there's an issue there where if you're using the minor, it's not going to have that head size that gives it that strong jaw. Yeah. So, it you know, you can drive it to start attacking, 
um, which is cool enough on its own, but your output for the experiment has to be slightly different. You know, you can't measure byte force as a function of you know, how aggressive you are. We just have to look at the fundamental movement behavior that the ant has because while the, the miner does have little teeth, it's more for picking up food and bringing it back to the colony rather than attacking it uh, like yeah. a living host. You potentially ended up with a heavyweight fighting a flyweight or something like that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, whenever I go into a nest, you know, I wear gloves. But on the off, I get plenty of ants just on me. And when a miner is biting you, it's like, oh, that's cute. You know, it's <laughs> uh, a major of Campanotis. They can't puncture your skin, but you do feel it. Like, like oh, I have a major on me. That's not, that's not good. Um, they actually try to cut you, and they their defense then is to spray formic acid into the wound. Naturally, is how they fight. Um, yeah, I've never, you know, they don't they don't cut human skin well enough to actually be able to spray it unless they latch on to like a place where you're already cut. Um, the bigger threat is the leaf cutter super soldier. If those, if you're not paying attention, you could get sliced open by those guys. And has that happened to you? It it has one one time I wasn't paying attention and I felt something running down my hand and I was like oh that's blood. <laughs> <laughs> um, Is that a bit of a rite of passage if you're someone who researches ants? I feel like it has to be, <laughs> and, and it makes for a great story too. Like, <laughs> yeah, a real badge of honor. Exactly. So where's that scar from? That's from an ant. <laughs> <laughs> so you've gotten into a high high level of complexity, but there's also a thing called a super colony. How does that fit into that level of complexity? So with the higher level of colonies, I think it's still represented by the leaf cutter, right? So we have currently a queenless leaf cutter colonies. We just we have a partnership with the Liberty Science Center in Jersey City that allows us to bring back individuals of various castes and we can examine them. However, in nature, there's leaf cutter colonies that are upward of 20,000 ants. And they can actually, they have huge series of tunnel systems and it's this massive workforce and you might wonder well, how on earth do they keep to their task. And so this is kind of where the idea of a super colony comes into play, where again, it's all epigenetically regulated. So genes are on and off and the queen is at a centralized location in the colony. Um, the super work majors are patrolling her area they actually pick her up and move her around to different regions of the nest so it's almost like a an indentured servitude dictatorship where yeah. they're working you know the queen's in quote unquote in charge but if you actually look at it she's not free to move as she wants she's picked up and moved elsewhere to like a nesting like nursery that is low on new brood she can't eat for herself she's fed and so it's not as glamorous of a lifestyle as one might think um but there's still like this constant communication between the individuals and we hypothesize through for that species like olfactory cues that tell it all right this is where the fungus gardens are this is where the nursery is and with such an extensive chambers and series like you can have it be you know a 500 foot in diameter nest which is massive that then individuals leave from and come back and it, that's really i think the apex of that definition of super organism where everything's working in unison for the good of each other and each you know you remove one part of it and then the whole system can implode because you won't have that specialized worker to do the very important task of that colony and at any point would separate colonies come together to create a larger colony? So it's tough to say. Um, there's very there's a lot of ant species that you know, haven't been studied yet, so we don't know how nest recognition works. We know in Campanotus, that more intermediate uh, complexity colony, if you try to merge two colonies, they attack each other because their odorants are different. And so they're being told that this is non-self- um, essentially attack because from an evolutionary perspective if you merge two colonies the genetics of your queen aren't necessarily the ones that are going to be passed on and so the whole goal of this right is to pass on the genetic information of the queen by her laying new queens 
And if you have two competing queens, um, there's no guarantee that your genetics are going to win out. It might be the other ones. Mm-hmm. With the more ancestral ants like Harbignathus, that's actually a trick that we have. They're very difficult to keep in the lab. And so if one colony is super low on individuals, we can merge them with another colony. And if they're big enough, you can actually have multiple queens, so multiple individuals laying. And because they don't have that evolutionary sense of nest mate recognition, they accept each other. And the only time they will not accept a new queen is if the colony is at a certain size where it doesn't accommodate multiple queens. So they have some kind of numerical threshold, whether that be olfactory driven or visual, we don't know, that tells them that you know, we have too many queens or too many reproductives that are laying. We need to have more individuals that are working for the colony and not just sitting around and laying. Yeah, so there's a real size dependency there. Yeah, and they may they may very well be one of these like more complex colonies that work in a similar way to Harbignathus. However, most intercolony recognition studies are done within the context of aggression and olfactory driven. So I'm not gonna I'm not wouldn't tell you that there's not such an example, but off the top of my head I can't think of one. And that could be because of just how things are studied. How do they actually fight? Colonies then kind of go to war with each other. What do ants do in a fight? Yeah, so it's really cool. If you look at a picture of a particular species, you can kind of guess as to what their mechanism of action is. So like with Campanotus, our carpenter ant, um, they have a very muscular head, like full of, full of muscle, and it's so that they can bite each other. Same thing with leafcutter ants. You'll have the super soldiers that essentially will bite in half other invaders. Mm-hmm. So they use the bite force. There's other ants such as the weaver ant, which are amazingly cool. They're like the engineers of the ant world. They build bridges with their bodies, not dead bodies, mind you, but they latch onto each other across a gap, allow other individuals to use them as a bridge, and then they, that bridge deforms and they cross over as well. Um, they spray an acidic, like an acidic venom compound at each other when they're fighting. Um, the army ant... Um, which I'm happy to send a picture of as well, has enormous teeth and it holds on to prey while other ants can also attack this held on and mobilized prey. So very much mouth central um, of how they attack, but the mechanism by which can be different. So using a venom or not, it's like leaf cutters do not have a venom gland. They won't spray. They just depend solely on their ability to cut organisms in half. Versus, you know, with a leaf cutter or the the carpenter ant, Campanotus, or the weaver ant have a an acid that they also spray after a smaller laceration. So, really, really cool kind of ant warfare that they have. And you mentioned their carpenter ants a couple of times. So, there's carpenter ants, uh, I think, fire ants, where maybe humans and those types of ants don't have the best relationships. In, in general, what is our relationship with ants? Are, are there more positive examples of where we kind of interact in more positive way? So <laughs> offhand, I always, the reason I think we talked about earlier is people have kind of a visceral negative reaction towards insects is because most of the interactions are considered negative. So like the carpenter ant, right, can dig into wood and ruin a home where the fire ants tend to be invasive and kill off hosts and they actually, you know, can sting us or same with the, the cow ant in the South of the United States have a really, really potent bite. Um, But there are ants that do, I think that undergo behaviors and functions of in a natural history context where they maintain the environmental status quo. So taking out negative insects as a part of like, the environmental niche that they're in. Um, by negative, I mean insects that can cause destructive damage to plant life and other animal life that we might take for granted. So if you remove the ants, the ecosystem would pretty much implode around that. What they do um, is very important. Um, even certain ants that we find very aesthetically pleasing, like the leaf cutter, 
Um, they can be beneficial if they're cutting certain kinds of shrubbery that want to be kept back. However, sometimes they can be near a farmer's field. They can cut you know, leaves that are important to crops and kind of devastate a particular crop. So it's very much in the context of where you live and who you're experiencing if the ants are more on the beneficial side actively to you. But I think passively, they're so important in maintaining the biodiversity status quo and maintaining, you know, just normalcy in the environment that we kind of don't look at and take for granted almost. Yeah, and I think I blame Hollywood a bit for some of the <laughs> negative perceptions. I'm sure I remember as a kid watching some movies where ants were swarming all over people, eating them, just taking over the world. Yeah, I think, you know, there is a species of army ant that like in, in the jungle that will swarm on you and will eat you if you get in their way. Um, the videos you can find on YouTube where you have thousands marching across a jungle floor devouring everything in sight is true, but the amount of times it results in human fatalities is nothing like what Hollywood would say. But you no. have to be really in the wrong place at the very wrong time. Yeah, and you can move out of the way, right? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to run. Is, is that it? You're just in their way, so instead of moving, they just eat their way through you? That's what it seems like. So there's not like buddies <laughs> right on this because it can be considered dangerous, but there almost seems yeah. to be a trajectory by which these ants are moving and they're eating whatever they're coming across and establishing a new colony elsewhere. But I don't know, in Hollywood movies, you're always running away from them on their trajectory. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully, you know, Hollywood movies like Ant-Man and the Avengers kind of can highlight, oh, ants are kind of cool. Yeah, well, this was one of my questions as well, um, is representation of ants and maybe some of the other insects that you've studied in movies. So I, I'm really thinking of things like David Cronenberg's The Fly and Ant-Man and Ants and A Bug's Life and those things. Yeah, so like when we mentioned, like Bug's Life and Ants is a pretty poor representation of what happens in ant colonies, <laughs> primarily because the, the male um, is the hero. Right. You would never have that because the male's only function is to mate. And then, like, seriously, the lifespan is quite crazy. Like, in our, in our carpenter ant, the majors live roughly a year and a half. The minors live about a year. The queens can live up to 20 years. And the males live two weeks. Right. So not enough time to save the colony, number one. <laughs> um, number two is that males have wings. So you'll know it in ants and a bug's life, the males do not have wings. And the reason they have wings in the biological context is to fly out from the colony and mate with, because they want to disperse their genetic information, right? A queen ant, which is also crazy, if they live 20 years, they'll only mate that one time when they were winged. So they don't have internal mating um, within the males that they produce. So the male needs to be able to fly away and flick and... I forget the the ant's name in the movie Ants. Uh, they don't have wings. So not exactly the ideal representation. Also, there's other males, like the soldier ant played by Sylvester Stallone in Ants is a male. Um, you'd have all females. So more of a, I think more of the Valkyrie from Norse mythology would be your army, like a bunch of really powerful women leading the charge rather than big bulky Sylvester Stallone, although he, sell, he sells tickets, like that's not exactly accurate. <laughs> uh, for Ant-Man, actually, they had uh, consultants who worked on ants. So one of our postdocs in, our, in the lab that I work in now actually was a consultant on the original Ant-Man of how they portrayed the ants uh, from the level of when, when Ant-Man is learning about the various species at his disposal. Those are actually quite accurate. The, fire ant forming rafts on a water source, um, the crazy ant that can attack and conduct electricity. All these are real. Um, the only qualm that we entomologists have with Ant-Man is the ant that Ant-Man rides, who has wings. Uh, he names Antony. Antony is actually Antonia. That's a female queen. Um, because of the, you can tell based on the, the size, it's a very large ant with a large abdomen. So presumably those are ovaries and not at all. And it's actually Campanotus. So it's the same species we work on. Uh, doesn't at all look like the male. 
very funny, but the males have super tiny heads and super tiny brains, presumably to accommodate the fact that all they need to do is mate and not make any real cognitive decisions for the good of the colony. Yeah. <laughs> but Ant-Man is actually, you know, that movie was quite, I think, the most represented representative of what actually happens in biology by Hollywood so far. Balan, this has been really fun, really amazing. So many wow moments in this. This just blew on my mind. Um, we've done over an hour and I've gotten through all my questions. So I'm just wondering, what are you working on at the minute and where is that going into the future? Yeah, so I'm actually working on a project that's we're close to submitting for publication. And it's looking at the effects of social isolation on the physiolog- physiology of an ant. And I think this is very relevant in today's society with COVID-19 and the social distancing protocols that we have in place where you and I unfortunately aren't in the same room discussing this and we weren't able to meet each other, even, I mean, different continents granted, but (laughs) it'd be cool to actually be in person, right? But I know like many uh, people working from home, not really interacting with friends or family due to health concerns. So you may wonder, I mean, what are the effects of being alone on an individual's physiology and system? And the ant is a great system to ask this question in because they're highly social. And so social enrichment and social interaction are very important at the ant. And that's just a function of their life history, right? They interact with individuals within the colony. Presumably it's bad if they're alone. So this is the question that I set out to answer. Number one, is it bad if they're alone? And number two, why? And so it turns out if you isolate newly hatched uh, minors or majors from a Campanotis colony, they die pretty rapidly when compared to group housed individuals. So individuals of five versus individuals of one. A group housed set of minors, um, I started the experiment over a year ago, they're still not all dead. So essentially the experiment is just life or death. And you ask, say, twice a week, how many individuals are alive in a given chamber, and you know how old that chamber is, and you can measure, like, essentially a death curve. So how long is life expectancy? And these minors that are group housed still have roughly 20% of them alive after a little over a year. However, isolated minors all die after 21 days. And so we thought this is a very striking phenotype of, you know, why are they dying so quickly when they're alone? Like, what's going on there? First, I tried to rescue this. So can you fix this death? And a lot of, we know these ants are very olfactory driven. So I performed extractions on their cuticle. So what smell defines as them. And if you put a a glass bead or a 3D printed square into the nest or into this box with the isolated ant. So if it has the odorant on it, uh, they actually live normal almost normal lifespans. They live much longer. If you, what we then we decided to do is be really crazy. And I have 3d printed ants at ant scale that I then coated an odorant as well. And if you do that, they live as good, if not better than the group housed ants. So you can actually trick them into believing that they're part of a colony and their behavior is crazy because you can see these isolated ants actually feeding the 3d printed model at the point of which that it's the model's mouth. So they're actually spitting trophallaxing food that they've harvested into the mouth of the 3D printed ant that smells like an ant. Does it matter if you're putting in just one 3D printed ant or do you have to put in enough that it seems like a colony? So I put in one 3D printed ant that's coated with two ants worth of smell. So the 3D model is a little bit bigger than the actual miner. So that's how we account for that upscale with two ants. Um, interestingly, if you put the model by itself without the odorant, it does not help. But it helps more than just the odorant alone. So we think the first line of information is olfactory. And the second line might be visual or tactile information because we used high resolution imaging to get surface texture of the ant that we then superimposed on our 3D printed model. And so then we did genetic sequencing on ants in isolation, ants that are in group housed, and then ants that are undergoing this rescue condition. So having ants with the 3D printed model with the the odorant on. And we found some genes that are really highly expressed in the isolated ants 
but are lowly expressed in group housed or rescue conditions. And so those genes I've just recently tried to turn off in isolated ants by injecting them with a construct, so a, a hairpin of RNA, so it'll bind to the RNA, mRNAs that would express the protein. And by binding them, they'll turn off that gene and re- lower them back to levels where they should be rather than highly expressed levels. And so right now I'm aging them and they look like they're living longer. So we may have identified genes that are involved in social interaction, uh, which is really cool. It seems to have an effect on lifespan and also has an effect on brain morphology. So we know if you isolate an ant, their brain shrinks in size, presumably due to lack of social enrichment. And this can be reversed either with the 3D printed model or by turning off these cool genes that we've identified. So, and this gene's actually conserved in humans. Never been studied in the social context in humans, but it'd be very interesting to say, you know, measure in a human who's been socially distanced due to COVID working from home by themselves versus someone who's quote unquote an essential worker going into a hospital and seeing if this gene has changed in humans as well. Yeah, and we're going through a bit of a giant experiment with that with kids, really, I think. Of, well, in, interesting isn't the right word, but um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with this generation as they grow up. I think they're calling them the COVID generation, which is just terrible. Yeah, it's quite sad. And, you know, I'm, you know, this was not a planned experiment, obviously, because like what this connection to COVID, because we started it way over a year ago, but it's fortuitous and we hope that it will have translational value to to humans and mammalian systems and maybe we can you know any chance of fixing the isolation in the ant maybe can be translated to humans because like you said we there could be long-term damage of being alone we there have been meta studies in humans so essentially patient charts that look at diseases in humans and they get patient history and it's been found that if you live in isolation you're more likely to get type 2 diabetes and cancer rather than if you live you know in a family household or interact with a lot of people so and that's just a meta analysis right like looking at the patient history and now we're kind of having a boom of that so if we can get out ahead of this and kind of figure out how to fix it in ants and translate that to humans before it becomes a problem that's kind of a big overarching goal i have and you've touched there on something else I wanted to talk about, which was your 3D printing events. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so I think it's kind of twofold. Um, one is using for experiments, like we discussed, like tricking the ants essentially into believing they have a friend and identifying what's the feature of the model, you know, what's the actual molecule of the olfactory cocktail that we're putting on, but also what's the feature of the 3D printed model that makes them think that they're not alone. So it's very much recognition of self, non-self, and fixing this isolation study that we can use with these 3D models. But on the flip side, we can also 3D print them to be much bigger and use them as a teaching tool to bring in more people into the fold to show the unique morphologies of these ants, um, what they look like, you know, you can, if you, I feel like if you can hold something and turn it around and inspect it and then see the tiny ant, you can very much so appreciate what the differences are between these individual species and appreciate, wow, these are really cool differences and I could see them and learn from them. So I would really hope that one day they'll be used as a teaching tool to promote science and communities where people might not think about ants and scientific studies. Valent, this has been really fascinating. I've really, really enjoyed it. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you for inviting me. I've, I've had a blast. Yeah. So before uh, before we sign off, do you want to tell people where they can find out more about you and about your work? Yeah. Um, I have a couple of places you can find me at. Uh, I have a website, www.valentzcacho.com. Uh, the spelling, I know, is complicated, but hope maybe we'll include them in the show notes. Definitely, yep. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Blent Z Cacho and on Instagram at Blent underscore Z underscore Cacho, where I post uh, about cool behind the scenes look, looks at ants, our 3D models, and other fun science things that 
I don't know, hopefully someone might find interesting. Do you want to just spell it out there? I think it's okay to take some time and do that. Yep. So Balint is B A L I N T Z K A C S O H. I would definitely say to people listening as well to follow you on Twitter. Uh, your Twitter feed's been really interesting. And with the, these images of Vance coming through regularly, it's brilliant. It's one of my favorite things to see on Twitter. Thanks. I try to promote the system because if you take good pictures, it's all of a sudden an aesthetic organism. And it's like, wow, this actually looks quite cool. And, you know, sometimes that's enough to bring in more people to find them fascinating. And and the more individual people we have who are interested in the topic, I think the greater impact research can have, obviously not just on ants, but on in any scientific field, the more accessible you make it, I believe the better. And it's the responsibility of our, us as scientists to promote what we study and make it as accessible as we can to the general public. Balint, that's, that's been amazing. Thanks. I'll let you go so you can get back to trying to give ants cancer. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. Remember to rate and review the show on the podcast app to help us get noticed up against big media company shows. I'd love to hear what you think of episodes so far and if you have any ideas for future topics. So get in touch by email info at curiositycake.co.uk or on Twitter at curiosity underscore cake. Bye for now. Curiosity Cake.